personal one. Uh, please sit down. We have uh, next session. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Uh, we are 30 minutes behind the schedule. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm Lei Zhou. I finished my PhD master degree from MIT in 2002 and 2005. And then I'm currently I'm a full professor in Virginia Tech. I work on the energy harvesting. Okay. I'm going to chair this session. And the speaker is Dr. Peters. And Dr. Peters is here. Okay. And uh, Dr. Peters is a research scientist at MIT PV lab. He finished his PhD from Germany in 1999, uh, work on the solar energy. Uh, after PhD, he continued working in Germany for two years, then moved to Singapore, work on the uh, solar energy too. In 2014, he moved to MIT. Okay. His talk is uh, Artificial Intelligence to Accelerate innovation of solar energy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peters. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. There's going to be a little bit of a gear shift from the session before for anyone who has been here. So I'm really going to talk about research. So the title of my talk, uh, as has been said, is um, Accelerate X Artificial Intelligence to Accelerate Innovation in Solar Energy. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean. But first, I should say that I'm really here to present on behalf of the MIT PV Lab. And uh, what I'm going to show is the work of all the students, postdocs, and people that have been working in the lab over the last couple of years. So um, the motivation for my work is shown on this slide. We've heard in the last discussion that we're facing a couple of quite daunting problems here at the beginning of the 21st century. And if you're looking into energy, you have things like global warming, climate change, but also challenges within the energy, water, food nexus, um, electromobility, to name just a few ahead of us. And if you're, well, we are a technical institution here. And if you're a little bit like me, then you probably believe that technology has to play a role in addressing some of these issues. But there's a problem here. And the problem is, if we're talking, if we're taking the example of solar energy, for example, if we're serious about addressing the climate targets, the, the goals that were laid out in the Paris Agreement by the IPCC, well, then, and we want to do this with solar energy. And we want to do this, for example, with innovation and new solar cell technology. In order to really make an impact, we have to have massive amounts of this new technology installed by 2030, latest 2040. That means that we have to have this technology ready to be installed within the next five years or so. Now, if we look into how long has it traditionally taken to develop technology in the green tech space, materials here, gallium arsenide, battery technology, fuel cells, lithium-ion batteries. Um, but if you're also looking overall, we've included one example, Teflon, which doesn't really have to do anything much with, with green tech energy, but um, green tech. But you can see that the timelines are pretty general. Technologies take about 20, 25 years to develop from the lab to when they are in the market. And there's a massive disconnect from the times line, timelines that we have. Sorry, can you say hop on that side? Oh, OK, sure, no worries. Okay, I, can, I can come over here, no problem. Um, so if you look at these timelines, there's a massive disconnect between those. Right? We wanted the technology actually to be available much quicker than what we can currently do. Furthermore, if we're looking into timelines that are relevant for investors or for developers, for example, if you look into the legislation periods of governments, the planning periods for corporations, if you look into how long do students actually stick around within our group, if we look into how long does it for I, uh, take for IP to leak out, then we find timelines that are in similar range, three to six years typically. So this is the massive disconnect between these two timelines. And that is the reason why we think it's worth thinking about changing the way that we do innovation in universities, the way that we do innovation and research in our labs. And we started, to about, uh, uh, started thinking about this, we came up with this new paradigm that we're trying to work towards, which we've come to call Accelerate X. Why Accelerate X? The uh, reason is pretty simple. We want to take down the timelines from 20 years to about two years. So this is standing for a, ten a tenfold improvement in the, in the rate at which we can do um, developments. So um, how do we think this might work out? It's all started 
by, um, it's all supported by what we can do with computers pretty much. So this is what I'm calling here better predictions. But under this fall, pretty much everything that, that is currently mentioned under tools that are developed within the context of big data, artificial intelligence, or machine learning. We believe that those will be helping us to drive innovations that will allow us to do material synthesis faster, um, device assembly faster, and also do faster diagnostics. And when we can put all of this together, then hopefully at one point we will be able to generate better products at a rate that is much, much faster than what we're currently doing today. So overall, you can see this is a pretty large vision that I've been putting out here. And given that we have only started within the last couple of years to work on this, we're certainly not anywhere near uh, um, finalizing this and delivering on this. But what I want to do in this presentation is that I want to show you some of the things that we have done over the last couple of years in the lab in working towards this kind of vision. I'm going to start with a couple of examples. I'm going to start with accelerating the material synthesis because this is the field where we started working on this also experimentally within the lab. And um, what we like to do here is we like to take a, a um, well, what we really want to do with this is that we want to increase the probability of success, the probability of, of, of really finding a, a material with a certain property in a certain time. And in order to do this, what we have to do is we have to increase the rate of discovery with which we investigate these kind of materials. The rate of discovery is given by the numbers of materials that can, we can screen um, divided by the time that it takes to generate and characterize these materials. And what we typically like to do is that we use a, a sport metaphor for this. Finding these materials is really like, no, no, I can't. It's not moving forward. Ah, there it is. OK, cool. This is um, like, like scoring goals in a soccer game. So what we would like to do is we want to score more goals. And there are two things that we can do in order to do this. Either we take more shots on, the, on, uh, um, on goal, or we're taking better shots. And the first thing that I want to talk about is this here, accelerating really our rate in which we can work and taking more shots on goal. I'm going to talk about what I, th what I mean about taking better shots a little later. OK. So the very first thing, the beginning of the story when we have been working on this was in 2015. Yeah, there we go. Um, when we started to write down in detail how long does it actually take us in the lab to make a solar cell. So the solar cell structure looks something like this. It's a typical thin film solar cell. Um, it takes a couple of different fabrication steps to realize one of those structures. And we started writing down um, how long does it take us to generate each batch of these cells and how long does it take us to generate each of these cells. So in total, in 2015, we were able to generate one unique sample in about half an hour. Right? Um, we've not only noted the entire time, we also worked out each of the process steps that we were taking. So from one that you started to hand over to the next step, how long does that take in order to really figure out within which of those steps do we have the biggest legs? Where do we have the largest rooms for improvement? And sometimes um, you find that these are pretty obvious and simple things. However, a solar cell is a relatively simple thing to do. And even then, we have several people involved in this. Um, that each don't really exactly know what everybody else is doing. So this kind of analysis can really allow you to, to quantify these timelines that you otherwise might not have a very good sense for. We certainly did not have a very good sense for it before we did this exercise. So you can see that between 2015 and 2017, we were able to reduce the time that it took us to generate one sample by half. Or if you want to put it a different, in a different way, the number of samples that we were able to produce in the lab during that time two years time period has increased by a factor of around two. So our productivity has increased by a factor of two. And how did we do this? One of the things that has actually hindered us the most is something that looks completely trivial first. The problem was that we had equipment situated in two labs, one our own, building 35, and one in building two. So I, I don't know how many of you have tried, have ever walked through MIT. This is quite a distance, especially if you have, if you're carrying samples around that you care about. You're not going to run. So the time to walk there and back can take up to 30 minutes, and we had to do this about four times for each batch of samples that we produced. So there was a two-hour transition time for every batch of samples we produced, and that's a massive part of the time it took to generate these samples. Huh? Um, there's an obvious solution in this that, that was easy to take once we had identified this as one of the major things that, that held us back in terms of, uh, of producing more samples. It's 
um, generate your own or consolidate your equipment and have everything that you need in order to make yourself ready in one room. That's exactly what we did. We built a uh, um, self-made spray pyrolysis setup. We bought another glove box that had a streamlined photo absorber preparation available to it, and we consolidated our thermal evaporation process that was needed to put all the metals on the solar cells. So that was a big part of what allowed us to improve this by a factor of two in terms of timeline. Um, why this is important is that if you want to do any further improvements of this, you have to identify what are your rate limiting steps. In this case, it was this thing. But without getting rid of these rate limiting steps, one by one, you will not be able to achieve these very large improvements that we initially were shooting for, right? So this is a factor of two improvement. That's nowhere near enough. That's nowhere near of what we wanted to achieve. So the next step was then to do a more sophisticated, detailed plan of workflow ergonomics for a particular problem. The particular problem that we wanted to address here is to generate lead-free perovskite technology. So why is that a problem? First, what are perovskites? Perovskites are certain types of materials that have made quite an impact in the PV community because they are the material that have shown the fastest progress in device efficiencies that we've ever seen in the field. Within no time whatsoever, they've jumped from basically being non-existent to 20% device efficiency. It's very remarkable. But there are a couple of issues with this technology as well. And one of them is that all the compounds that generate these very high efficiencies contain lead. And they do not only contain lead, they contain lead in a bioavailable form. That means that it's basically water soluble. And if you're trying to commercialize a technology with a toxic component that is potentially bioavailable, you're going to run into all kinds of problems. So there's a big, big effort in the community to try and get rid of lead within perovskites. It's very hard to do. Um, anyway, we chose this particular problem to test out this kind of approach that we wanted to take. And I'm not going to go into detail, I'm just going to show you how this worked out in the end. Um, one of the things that was important, though, that I, I want to mention is that uh, we had to find a singular growth platform that allowed us to explore a wide range of different parameters within this field of lead-free perovskites. So, um, a perovskite is a crystal structure. It's the name of a crystal structure. This is ABX3. Um, and the lead sits on the B cation side. So we were working on a couple of precursors that are A cation, X anion, and B cation, X anion. And we had a total of 13 AX precursors and a total of 15 BX precursors. And if you put that together, then you have a material platform that with, 15, with these 28 materials, you can generate 96 different uh, um, samples. So that was a big part of being a little bit smarter about the testing. We're going to talk a little bit more how we came to the conclusions about which of those to pick in a while. But here in this case, just to make sure, you have a limited set of samples that allowed you to generate a, a quite wide variety of, of these samples. Now, this is a very impressive result. Unfortunately, there is not a single very good picture to show us what we have done. So the best one that we have is this one. It shows the workflow of all the different types of components that we have done from start to in, this, in the end finish. And what's important really are the numbers that, we have, that we've been able to do. So, we came to call this a campaign, a campaign because it is a dedicated effort that we've done over about two, a little bit more than two months in order to generate all the samples that we wanted to investigate this particular problem. So, and the really impressive part of this is that the number of unique compounds within these samples were around 75. And that is about 30 materials per month where we were able before to generate about one of those. So this is a 30-fold increase in the, in, the test, in, the, in the range of different materials that we could test in the lab. And this is just by optimizing our workflow. We do not have any fancy robotics or anything in this. Uh, if we were able to automize this process, we would be able to probably increase the whole throughput by another, uh, um, by another order of magnitude or two. And they were already in this first test. This was basically to test our methodology. There were quite remarkable results in this. But the first one is that we've been up from 1 to 30 unique materials. The second is that among these 30 materials, there were two compounds that we were the first ever to make. At least they haven't been reported in any literature before. And among the 30 compounds, there were also, sorry, among the 75 compounds that we made in total, there were also four materials that we were able to synthesize in thin film for that has never been done before. So we believe that this is a huge step in order to really screen faster for these kind of materials, and in this case, to solve this problem of lead-free perovskites. 
Um, in this case, we have only worked on the, on the material composition. Um, and we've done this in a very limited approach. However, we see that similar approaches are already taken in labs all over the world. There's a big effort in Singapore going on that Tonio Bonasisi, the head of the lab, is involved in to test for thermoelectric materials and a couple of others. Um, they are using exactly these techniques. There are labs in Germany working on this. Um, labs that have done more steps towards this are certainly, if you go to bioengineering and uh, um, and pharmaceuticals, you'll see much more automation that has similar flavors to this already. However, please keep in mind that we're working here on semiconductors, and within semiconductor physics, this is really a relatively new approach. So this is the first example that I wanted to show you. How can you start to think in order to come to these much, much higher synthesis rates that we need in order to accelerate this kind of progress? Um, and with the experimental results, I want to leave it at this, and I want to show you a couple more examples. The, the next one is the, these better predictions, the use of computation. I want to focus a little bit on that. Um, and what is this driven on that is basically clear to everyone? It's not so much the methodology. We've known how to do machine learning. We know how to do artificial intelligence in terms of algorithms for quite a while. But what is a continuous improvement, and that hasn't stopped within the last couple of years, it has consequences right now, is our ability to make much, much more powerful computers. So a bit of fun here, I've plotted the first computer that I ever worked with. That was the one that my fa father bought about 30 years ago. A wonderful machine, a Hewlett Packard Vectra 386 with a 25 megahertz CPU, um, two kilobytes of RAM, and an amazing 200 megabytes of hard drive. Uh, beautiful at that point in time. Um, the computer on which I I'm working on standing right there at the back. It's an HP, also Hewlett Packard C-Book with a, a cumulative 20 gigahertz of CPUs, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and 700 gigabytes of hard drive. So three to four orders of magnitude improvement in all of these abilities. A different way to show this is this is something that is similar to, the, uh, to Moore's Law. This one here shows the dollar for every uh, um, per transistor per hertz. So this is, this is basically the cost of a computation, of one computation. Um, and this has this very impressive exponential reduction over the last 40, 45 years. Being able to compute something has become cheaper and cheaper and is continuing to, going, get, to get cheaper and cheaper. There's no sign here that this trend is going to end within the next couple of years. On the other side, we have here the personal cost, the costs of a student within the lab at MIT that we have to pay on. This one is here shown between 1990 and today. And these costs have gone up by 50%. And that is not you know, uh, restricted to MIT. You could pick any of 100 different examples. The cost for personnel are going up. And what that means is that we are going to invest in hardware more and more that actualizes, helps us to maximize human productivity. It's basically reducing this part. And there are a number of consequences, both good and bad, of this. And I don't want to go at all into the discussion about this. In this case, I'm going to talk of some of the more um, happy consequences about what we can do with this. <clears throat> what we can do with this is we can calculate much more efficiently and much faster. And one thing that we can use this for is I've talked before about um, us finding certain materials. And now we're hanging again. There we go. Um, that, we were, that we wanted to use in our screening process. So in this case, what we've done is we've used a computer to screen about 27,000 semiconductor materials from a database for certain properties. I should elaborate on that a tiny bit. This is, this is really about now taking smarter goals. Smarter goals means you have to know something about your material. And one thing that we know about perovskites, what makes it so interesting, is that it's a very defect-tolerant material that means it doesn't get destroyed very easily if you mix in something that should act as a defect that should destroy it. If you compare perovskites to silicon, perovskites can accommodate about 100 times more contamination from the metals before it starts deteriorating in the same way that silicon does in performance. It's quite amazing what this material can do. It means you don't need a clean room to process it, for example. Um, and we wanted to know what kind of properties are responsible for this. And from theoretical calculations, we knew that it has something to do with the chemical composition and how the orbitals form within this ABX3 compound. So we plotted here, this is a work by Riley Brand, a former student of the lab, where these perovskite materials lie 
on this triangle that shows the distribution between PD and S orbitals. And you can see that all the perovskites fall within this, this range here. So no P orbital, um, high V orbital fraction of Orion's S orbital fraction. And then we can look into what other types of components, what other types of materials show the same kind of properties in terms of the uh, um, exhibition of orbitals. Uh, you, you play around with the structures a little bit, you play around with the com materials that you do a little bit, and you find out that you have to look out for certain things. So this is shown here as, a, as an example for tin. And what we found for tin is that tin in this two plus charge state, all of those components, they fell onto this axis similar to perovskites, whereas tin in a four plus charge state didn't do this. So this gives you huge clues about what kinds of materials you have to look for. I'm not going to go much further into this. I'm just going to say that we use this to identify a number of materials. Again, uh, Riley Brandt, a student from the lab, did this. And what he did was he, he identified six unique materials that should show defect tolerance and therefore should show a larger lifetime. Lifetime means this is the time that an excited charge carrier can stay within the valence band before falling back. And the non one nanosecond lifetime is a measure for what you absolutely need in order to make a soda cell. So the prediction was that these materials should all show lifetimes beyond one nanoseconds. Completely new prediction. We didn't know any theory about this before. We just had these, this kind of ideas how the materials should look like and that we believed that was the case. And he synthesized these six materials and every single one of those showed a lifetime beyond the one nanosecond, which I think is a very um, impressive results. We did certainly not expect that the screening would be as successful, but it shows that you can be smarter about how you make these kind of decisions. And this is ultimately what helped us generate these screening criteria. Okay, I want to give a little bit of a different example. Um, that's energy yield predictions, um, something that I've been working on. So there's a couple of results from, from my own papers. Um, and this is looking into more into how do solar cells actually operate outside? What happens if you put a solar cell outside and what kind of material properties are especially important? And um, I've plotted here a couple of things. These here are curves that show the maximum possible efficiency that a solar cell can generate as a function of its band gap. And in addition, the different lines here show um, how this efficiency changes as a function of temperature. So you have cool temperature here on the top and as you go from blue to red, it becomes warmer and warmer and warmer. So for fundamental reasons, solar cells efficiencies go down when it becomes warmer. But there's an additional difference here when you're looking at the band gap. Materials with a small band gap, like silicon, are a lot more sensitive to changes in temperatures than materials with a larger band gap, like cadmium telluride. So you can see this in detail here. This is the sensitivity of the performance of a solar cell out, made out of these materials to temperature. Silicon has clearly a larger sensitivity. Similar for water. Silicon has a stronger sensitivity to the, the um, nah, precipital water in the atmosphere. And that is because water absorbs light. And because the absorption bands in which water absorbs light lie predominantly in the infrared, silicon is much more affected by this than cadmium telluride. So again, larger sensitivity. Okay, that really plays a role when you put these cells outdoors. We, had, um, we have then developed this model, which uh, um, takes in, and here, here comes the data into this. There's a satellite beta that we got from NASA. Um, meteorological conditions, um, humidity, temperature, aerosols, ground reflectant irradiance. And we use this to calculate the kind of spectra that we'd expect at every point on the planet. And we calculated from this the output of different types of solar cells at every grid point of the planet for every day of the year. If you do this, these are about 25 million calculations. Um, it takes about two months to finish that on a reasonably well-kept server. Okay, so now let's look at, at how this plays out in, in the different parts of the world. We were lucky enough to find experimental data that we could use to verify these results. The measured data is shown here. So what this shows here is the difference in performance between silicon and cadmium telluride. The upper one is for Singapore, the lower one is for Parisburg, Ohio. So Singapore, one degree north, Equatorial climate means it's hot and humid all year long. Cadmium telluride is a lot less sensitive to conditions than, than silicon, and consequently we see that cadmium telluride here performs, has a, a performance advantage over silicon throughout the entire year. Differently in Parisburg, in the winter it's cold and dry, so silicon performs better than cadmium telluride, in the summer it reverses. Uh, but you see this big change throughout the year. 
So these are the calculated results. Here are the blue dots with the program that we've developed. And you see there's a quite decent agreement between what we've calculated and uh, um, the measurements. The, import, the interesting part is that most of the software that, that were used until then to calculate how, much, how should I design a PV power plant and what is the revenue of this power plant didn't take these effects into account. I have to say that they have amended that, so the software does take to these kind of changes into account now, but at the time when we wrote this paper, it didn't. So this is a software called PVSYST. It's one example of several um, that people use to design PV systems, and you can see that it neither captures this advantage that cadmium telluride has, nor does it capture this yearly variation between silicon and cadmium telluride in Parisburg. And that is a problem. It's a problem when your, uh, when your profit margins are small, right? If a 3 4% difference can cut into your profits. It's also a problem if you have to make a choice about which technology you're using. If you, here in this case, you might want to use the, the technology with a higher band gap, but you wouldn't know because none of the predictions made that, right? So that's the reason why this is important. We generalized this. this example. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we generalized this. We did the calculations then for the entire planet. And um, again, here you see that the, it's, it's pre pretty much the, s the same result, but I wanted to show you these maps. Um, the smaller variations being the cadmium telluride is much less, much less sensitive to the operating conditions than silicon, which shows much larger variations. If you look at, into the differences between those two and uh, um, see what you'd expect where each of those materials performs especially well, you have this brown region is where silicon performs uh, especially well. It's in all cold and, uh, and, and dry climates. And per, uh, cadmium telluride would perform especially well in the blue colored regions. OK, we can generalize this further by looking at other technologies. So we've done calculations for CIGS, silicon, gallium arsenide, cadmium telluride, and perovskites um, to calculate the energy yield on the whole planet for all of these technologies. And incidentally, if you're interested in this, all these maps are av available for, for download on the uh, website of the journal or also from our own website in the, uh, um, from the institute. If you download this and you multiply these maps with a measured efficiency, you'll get the energy yield so you can have uh, a very easy way towards getting that for your own lab results. Uh, but there's more interesting things to be done here and it is when you analyze the data. So this graph here shows the distributions of the harvesting efficiencies. The harvesting efficiencies being the efficiencies under which these solar cells truly perform outdoors. Hmm? These are the, the five different technologies that we looked at. Um, and then you can see the median, where the median efficiencies lie. So we've plotted the median efficiencies here as a function of band gap. And we've also plotted the efficiencies that you would measure under the so-called standard testing conditions, which are used to certify uh, uh, solar cell materials. So any solar panel that would have a, a watt number on the back of the panel would use these conditions and would use these measurements. If you plot the difference between those two, you find that there is a linear relation, an almost linear relation, between the band gap and the penalty and efficiency that you get. And that is interesting if you want to compare solar cell made of different materials. It's also interesting if you want to make a decision about what kind of material to use where, right, or what kind of materials you want to screen. There's a clear benefit of going to larger band gaps than to going to smaller ones. So we have a better bound with this to look for materials with certain types of band gaps. That's also a way to become smarter in terms of your screening. In this case, by taking into account how the materials would actually perform really outdoors. Okay, um, I don't know how much time we have. I have a couple more things to, to talk it's about. Time for it. Hmm? We, we, we have 40 minutes break. And the next session starts <laughs> okay. at three. Fantastic. So if nobody's bored, I don't see anyone falling asleep right now. So I'll, I'll talk about the diagnostics and a little bit of systems design as well. So diagnostics. Um, this is another way where we wanted to accelerate. Um, and there are a couple of things that really, really can do with acceleration. One of the issues or one of the challenges where we've really seen, um, where we really want to do improvements is on XRD classification. So XRD stays for X-ray diffraction. And what you do is say you have synthesized a certain material. Um, and then you actually want to know what it is. You want to know in what structure you have just now synthesized. So you measure this X-ray diffraction pattern, and then you have a person sitting on a computer figuring out what this looks like. Right? It's a, most, in most cases, a manual job, and it's a very difficult one, because these patterns can look like anything, and you have to have a lot of experience to really figure out what do you really have there. So what we wanted to know is, if it's, is it possible 
to get one of those patterns and to make halfway decent predictions using a computer about what is the dimension of this material? Is it a 3D crystal? Is it something that crystallized two-dimensional? Or even better, do we know what kind of space group it is? So that's the task. Right? We wanted to input the XRD spectrum and output the dimensionality or the space group. Um, whereas dimensionality is, is defined in this somewhat lax way that, that we've done here. A space group is a much better uh, um, measure, so I'm, I'm going to concentrate a little bit on that. Um, we have an additional problem with this. So in order to do this, we had about 150 samples available to us measured. And that is a relatively small data set in order to train something that works with artificial intelligence. It's in most cases not sufficient. And we've seen that the initial results by just using the experimental data was not good enough. So we had to do something about this. And the way that we have done this is by exploring what can we do to augment the data. And this data augmentation in that case worked, it takes into, a, uh, it takes into consideration domain expertise. Whenever you want to be, improve these kind of things, you have to include domain expertise. There's no way around this. And in this case, the domain expertise that we had is that we knew when we do this kind of measurement, what are the uncertainties in this? What happens? What are the most common f errors that this kind of equipment does? And the three ones that play the biggest role are peak scaling. So the height of these peaks may be different depending on, on uh, um, the exact measurement conditions. Peak elimination, sometimes you miss some of them. And pattern shifting, sometimes the pattern shifts around a little bit. If you know roughly how much your equipment is doing this, then you can use this information to take your, uh, to your measured spectra to generate a whole number of, let's say, plausible spectra. Spectra that, based on the experimental data, the, the uh, tool could have uh, generated just as well. And using those actually helps your training algorithm a lot. So these are the results. Your initial baseline was um, a success rate of below 60%. Put it in a different way, the algorithm was half the time wrong when it looked in, into these kind of structures. And by using 80% um, of our experimental data plus, uh, sorry, 80%, yes, 80% of our experimental data plus the whole simulated set and tested it against the remainder of the experimental data, right, the success rate for this particular experiment was 89%. Or in this case, the algorithm was wrong one in 10 times. So there's a huge difference in those. Um, furthermore, the big advantage of this is, oh, I, ha I have to say that um, if you let a human, an experienced human do this, they don't get a better success rate than that, typically. Um, not for the materials, at least, that we have been working with. And also, it takes them a huge amount of time to do this, several hours at the least. The, the screening algorithm could do it in a couple of minutes. So a huge improvement in terms of time, and in this case, I think we're close to getting something that is, that is at least reasonably accurate. So that is, uh, for us, is a big win. I'm showing this here also, how this works as a function of the augmented experimental data that you include. Um, it starts to uh, um, consolidate here at around 1,500, 2,000 spectra. So these are the numbers that we've been using. Um, one thing that I should say in addition uh, is that, um, as is so often the case with these kind of, of um, artificial intelligence tools, you have to find the right one to do the job. You can see that the results vary hugely depending on what kind of algorithm you take. And in this case, the all convolutional neural network was the, be was the one that yielded the best results. You certainly have to look a little bit closer into this, but this is the one that we're using for now. Okay, um, final thing that I wanted to talk about is um, device fabrication. It's um, just because this is a very neat example, and we had this, we've talked about this before. This is some of the work that we've done in collaboration with Amos Winter, and actually Wei, who's sitting here in the audience, is part of that. Um, so this is about desalination um, and de defining a so solar desalination problem. It's a, it's a slightly bit different, but it also shows what you can do if you use better data, or if you use data in a better way. So you have the following problem. You have a number of components, solar panels, water storage, battery, and here this is the, the EDR system. And you can scale all of those. What you want to do, or what you want to achieve, is you want to generate a certain amount of water given the solar spectrum or solar characteristics that you have as an input. And there's 100 million ways to do this. They all use different configurations of these four components. So it's a four-dimensional optimization problem, and you can do a, uh, um, a, a parameter optimization for this. And the way that we've done this is that we've tried, well, we first built our model, 
and we've done the computer simulation on the, of this model and tried to optimize this. And the initial result that we've been able to come up with is that um, we have been able to find system configurations at a level of about $20,000 uh, for this particular system, where the initial cost was close to $40,000. The $40,000 one would be if you told an engineer without any kind of experience of how to optimize this. This is, this is kind of the uh, rule by thumb design that most people would do. But if you use the machine uh, here in this case to do the optimization for you, you're able to reduce the cost massively. And this has a huge impact. The system was built for India. Um, it's standing in Chelleru, which is a small village close to, oh God, was it Hyderabad? Yeah. Um, so um, if you th take into account how much these people are able to spend on any of those systems, a reduction in of 40%, which we had here in cost, is, makes a huge difference. And in fact, this is not the end of the story. We have been working more on this, and we are now able to make systems that are powered by solar that are competitive to, uh, uh, or that can compete with systems that you're running on the grid. So this is, I think, a very, very huge step for us in order to generate solar power tap devices. I want to show one thing, one final thing in addition, is that optimization like this can also lead you to new learnings. And I think this is really an important uh, lesson to take into this. Um, what we did implement here is a certain type of flexible operation. We changed the schedule on which this thing is running to optimize, uh, um, to optimize the system. And at the moment, the most determining or the, the, the thing that determines the price of this entire desalination system are the desalination stacks. So you would r run the system um, for about 14 plus hours a day in order for it to, be, uh, um, to work commercially well. If you were able to reduce the membrane costs by a significant amount, here this assumes an 80% reduction in the membrane cost, then you would be able to operate the systems in a different regime. You would be able to devise a new operation strategy um, that we've calculated theoretically, which would allow you to change the cost of the power systems in addition. So here, an innovation in membranes would have an impact on the design for your entire system and would have a further impact of reducing the cost. So you get a more than linear effect of this downscaling of membranes. And, and these results are used by, mem or we've shown these to membrane manufacturers and they've been quite interested in this and they're really trying to work on, well, they're working anyway to bring down membrane prices. That's in their best interest. Um, but this is a, a little bit of an additional motivation for them to work on this. Okay. With that, I want to quickly summarize this. Um, we've, what I've been talking about is timelines and tech development, and that we believe that we have a huge to gain from speeding those up. And the program that we're working on is trying to get to at least a tenfold increase in the t uh, improvement in the time that it takes us to get a tech from initial uh, um, idea to the market. The tools that we're using that really drive this are coming from the fields of machine learning, big data, and AI. And I think this is really exciting because a lot of times when people talk about machine learning and AI, it's within the methods development of those, right? It's, it's very difficult to link them up to real problems and see progress. And I think we're making progress on that, actually, that we see how these tools um, are working and allowing us to do things better than before. And the third point is the last one that I've made, that these kind of advanced computations that we've done have in many ways triggered new discoveries that have really made us change the way that we think about this. All right, with that, I uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. How many data points do you use for the analysis like the um, you know, neural networks and all this stuff? Do you use the same data point? Sorry, for which one? The XRD? How many data points, which data data points do you use for the artificial intelligence neural network? You mentioned I saw uh, 800 or something like that. Yes, yeah, so it was a total of, I mean, um, we had 150. The, the set of experimental data was 150, and we augmented it quite up quite a lot, so I think in this case it was um, somewhere between two and four thousand. So you augmented with uh, what? Simulation? Yeah. That's so when we augmented it with the knowledge about how the, um, what is the uncertainty within the tool, right? If you measure a spectrum, the measured spectrum um, ha has certain errors compared to the actual spectrum, the real one if you want to, right? 
And what the tools does that it does these three things by changing the 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 magnitude, the uh, of you know, the amplitude of your of your peaks. It can slightly change the peak position, and sometimes it it erases peaks. And these three actions we have randomly distributed over the the sets that we had, the experimental sets. So that that's what I meant with uh, plausible spectra, right? We try to generate spectra that the machine could have produced just as well as the one that it actually produced. Yes. It's synthetic data, but it takes into account uh, a knowledge about the uncertainty within the tool. So it is not, not entirely random, right? It, it includes, you use, yeah. Say, if you use random, that means that you know the causality. In machine learning, one of the steps that we skip is that you say, OK, it's a black box. Yeah. I don't care about causality. So it's an augmented learning than anything else. It is, absolutely, yes. OK, thank you. So we have one question. Yes, there's one. So yes, we do have those. In some other cases, we use them. In other cases, we don't. So we are, we are really playing a lot, around with a lot of uh, a methodology. Um, one part that I actually removed from this presentation because it would have just taken up too much time is um, that we're using a lot of Bayesian inference in order to make uh, um, extract material parameters. And for Bayesian inference, you, all, you need a model. And uh, uh, sometimes we use uh, um, nah, densi density function DFT type calculations in order to get information about the molecules that we want to, sc to scan for. That is one approach. So we, have, we had one student who recently graduated who spent almost her entire time doing this kind of DFT calculations to predict certain properties of certain molecules. Um, but we're also working with approaches where we're trying to use these kind of black box approaches to see you know, it, it's really, um, we have all these tools available to us. We want to figure out how can they be useful. So we're trying every approach on every tool and just seeing you know, what kind of results do we really get with these. Thank you. And that has sent papers to the game. Thank you, Dr. Peters. You can take 15 minutes break, then you can go to other sections or come back to the panel about.